bawled my eyes out, telling the Lord, I cannot do this. I'm not strong enough. I am not. I can't do it. I stood there not feeling the Lord anywhere near me, and my head had to tell my heart, you know where he is. You know he is around you, surrounding you, arms around you. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, a podcast with unique stories from the kingdom of God, told by the people compelled to live for him. Last week, we shared the true story of Hannah Overton, a mother of five that was falsely accused of murder and sentenced to life in prison. If you missed it, you can hear that story by visiting our website, compelledpodcast.com. But today, we'll hear another story about walking through trials. Our guest is Ryan Dobson, the son of Dr. James Dobson. Despite many hardships and trials, Ryan is a living testimony that God will never leave our sides. That story coming up right after a word from today's sponsor. This episode of Compelled is sponsored by Patriot Academy. Patriot Academy raises up leaders with a biblical worldview that boldly champion the cause of freedom and truth through government. Patriot Academy holds intense week-long trainings at state capitals around the nation, and attendees learn about the legislative process by participating in a mock legislature, filing and debating bills and policies. All the while, they learn fundamental principles and truths. I actually attended Patriot Academy a few years ago in Texas, and it was an incredible experience. I got to sit at the same desk and debate on the same floor as actual Texas legislators. I made close friends and learned important character traits. But most importantly, I saw firsthand the desperate need we have as Christians to engage the culture and not shrink away. This summer, Patriot Academy will hold seven different academies across America, and there's a good chance one of them will be near you. Compelled listeners can receive $25 off tuition by using the promo code COMPELLED. Learn more at patriotacademy.com. Again, that's patriotacademy.com. When I was young, I gave my heart to the Lord. And absolutely, it wasn't like one of those, I mean, my dad talks about becoming a Christian at a super, super early age and then contemplating it, sitting in the backseat of his parents' car and contemplating what he had done. Um, and I wasn't a crazy genius, but I definitely knew I love Jesus and I want to do the right thing. And that's my temperament. Like people are like, oh, you, I'm tattooed and I've got, oh, I don't have a mohawk right now, but I've had a mohawk and earrings, all that kind of stuff. And be like, oh, you're the strong willed child. I was not, not on any level. You looked really? at me funny and I'd be like, what? Yes, no, sit, stay, huh? Yes. Uh, you I'm were the, sorry. the people pleasing Dobson. hundred percent. My yeah. sister was definitely strong willed. She'd tell you that. I was not at all. Last fall, my wife and I traveled to Colorado to visit family. And while we were there, we collected a few podcast interviews, which you'll hear this season. One of those interviews was with Ryan Dobson. His father, Dr. James Dobson, probably is a familiar name for most of you since he was responsible for the creation of many Christian organizations and projects, including Focus on the Family, the Family Research Council, Family Talk, and even Adventures in Odyssey. Over the last several years, though, Ryan, his son, has written books and spoken at many conferences about living as a Christian sold out for Jesus. And during our interview, it was obvious that Ryan's passion for God's kingdom is intense. But the first question I had to ask was, what was it like growing up as the son of James Dobson? That's for sure the number one question I've been asked. Yeah. My sister too, what was it like growing up? Um, it was super normal until I hit sixth grade. Substitute teacher comes, taking role. She says, Ryan Dobson, I said, here. And she goes, oh, like Dr. Dobson. And I go, yeah, that's my dad. Then she goes, oh, Holly, I know you wish he was. And then she moved on and I was like, what? And I didn't even react. I, I, I just was confused at what she would say. Yeah. And then all at the whole class erupts. It is his dad, it is, that's his dad. That's totally his dad. And, and then I was like, why does everybody know who my dad is? Yeah. I had no idea what was going on. And the teacher got very embarrassed. Really? Yep. Totally embarrassed. Uh, Why? Again, who knows? Yeah. I was so clueless. Uh, the very next day, substitute teacher came back and brought a stack of my dad's books for me to bring home for him to autograph for her. Okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with that in general. But the kids of famous people get asked things of them, and it is expected that you will do whatever it is that's asked. And no one ever tells those kids, you know, you could say no, it's okay. 
Yeah. And I finally asked my dad and he goes, Ryan, you don't have to say, you don't have to answer the question. Just tell him no. I go, what do you mean? He goes, just say this is none of your business. I'm like, you can say that? He's like, yes, you have the mic. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so that, that did, that changed it. I had no idea we were famous, but apparently that let the floodgates open so that everyone else could be like, oh, you didn't know you were famous? Yeah, you're totally famous, man. We all listen to you. I went to a Christian school, so virtually every parent was listening to Focus on the Family in carpool on the way to school. Wow. So if there was ever a story of my sister or I, hundreds, all the kids knew about it. Hundreds of people, every teacher. And that's the other thing too. There are logistical things that people don't know about radio or, or things like that, where he would record a broadcast and play it three, four months later. Yeah. Or tell a story that happened a year or so ago. And people thought it happened, you know, my dad was playing tetherball when he was a teacher years before and got hit in the face and broke his nose. And had been telling that on the radio. I had people like, oh, is your dad okay? You know, and I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. What happened to him? Well, I already broke his nose. He did? Well, what happened? I don't, I don't have any idea. Well, it was, it was years hilarious. ago that it, he was just telling, retelling a story. As Ryan grew older, he had a lot of exposure to Christianity. But something still seemed to be missing. That is, until one summer when his life would be changed forever. When I was 16, my parents started to get me to go to a camp here in Colorado called Summit. Yeah. It teaches Christian worldview. They explained it this way. They said, oh, it's a lot like summer school, but you'll like it. And I was like, oh, okay. Not a chance. Uh, I put my, and again, I was not defiant. So at 16, when I was like, I will not go to that camp. Yeah. They were like, um, I guess. Yeah. Like, I'd never said no before. Yeah. 17 came around. My dad was like, you know, that camp I want you to go to? I was like, yeah, I'm not going to go. Like, I don't want to go to, I, I was a terrible student. I really, really, people say that and they joke around. I got really, really bad grades all of my scholastic career, all of it. Um, I'm super, super ADHD. I test very, very high, but on day to day, I got bad grades. And you want to put me in summer school? I was like, nope. And my dad said, well, I got a deal for you. I was like, okay, what's the deal? And he goes, well, if you go to camp, the car you drive will still be here when you get home. Ooh. I was like, what, what a if, deal. What if I don't go to camp? He's like, then we sell it tomorrow. Yeah. I'm like, we do? And he goes, I do, so who cares? <laughs> I was like, oh. So I went to Summit. Uh, ran away my first night. You I, ran away? Yeah, totally. Talked two girls into leaving with me. People are hearing this being like, see, you were totally strong-willed. I was not. I just felt... It was injustice to me. It yeah. was unjust. It was unfair. It was early, early, early in the summer. And we were watching a black and white film that night starring Ronald Reagan, the actor, pre-politics. Okay. Talking about the dangers, the dangers of the global spread of communism. Oh, I thought I was going to die. So I snuck out, went to the NBA, watched, watched the finals. And then in the middle of the game, Doc Noble, who was the president of the camp, and Jay Butler, who was vice president, walked in and caught me. And I knew my life was pretty much over at that point. For sure. Wow. Yeah. But what I didn't know is we were both thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> no one tell James Dobson. Like, who? what camp wants to tell Jim Dobson you, we lost your kid the very first night? By the oh way, there's only goodness. 13 of us. It wasn't like a massive camp. There was just 13 of y'all. Hundreds of kids. No, 13. Oh, my goodness. There was a, a, barely a handful of us in this camp. And I got away with three of us. So, uh, oh, yeah, I had KP. I washed dishes every day for the rest of camp. They made me get up early. And here's the truth. I had been missing my faith. And back in the day when Carter was in the election or Reagan was in the election, there was a cultural war of morality and values going on. And there were smart people that thought Carter was a good guy. I'm not saying he's an evil person. He's just not as smart as people think he is. And he was a terrible politician. He was awful but they sounded smart and they disagreed with my parents a lot and i'm really really black and white and so in my mind my parents are either right or they're wrong i've always believed they're right but these other people sound really smart what if my parents are wrong why why are they wrong and being uber black and white with me there aren't that many reasons are you not smart is this person smarter than you? Yeah. And that's why they know the truth and you don't. That's yeah. a scary thing for 17-year-old Ryan. Are your parents not smart enough to figure out actual capital T truth? Are they lying to you? Who knows? 
I mean, hey, we believed in Santa when we were little, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe when I'm 25, they're going to go, hey, that Jesus thing, oh, we just didn't want you to have sex before you were married. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Maybe. Or are they just not that smart? Have they been duped? Have they been tricked? I don't know. And the thought that maybe they're wrong for maybe one of those reasons, I just could not bear. I couldn't bear finding out that my dad, because he's the rock, he's the anchor, he's the rudder of our family's ship. To find out he got tricked, hoodwinked, he's wrong, he's not that smart. I didn't want, for me, this is such a weird black and white thing for my brain. I just couldn't take the pressure of having to figure out what was true on my own at that point in my life. Yeah. And so my solution, hey, whatever, whatever, man. Who are you going to vote for? Whatever. What do you care about? I don't care. I got my skateboard. I got my friends. What about Jesus? Okay, I'll go to church. Is it true? I hope so. But I don't want to dig too deep because if I find out it's not, I don't know what direction to go in anymore. Yeah. I'd be lost. Yeah. If someone could prove to me there is no Jesus, I'd be lost today. And I couldn't take it. Summit gave it back to me because they had people that weren't just kind of smart. They were real smart. Yeah. Holistically smart. Not only one subject smart, but they knew art and literature and music and poetry and food and all kinds of things. They were smart in all kinds of areas. They'd been well read and they could quote things and they, they made sense and they agreed with my parents. It was a revelation. It was just, it was just an epiphany, the light bulb off in my head of, oh my goodness, there were the relief, the relief I felt knowing I could go home and trust everything that came out of my parents' mouth. For me, that was the biggest deal in the world. Wow. Like I talk to people about that today and they're like, you're kind of a weirdo. I'm like, I don't know. For a kid, trusting your parents may be one of the biggest things in the world. And Summit did that for me. It taught me a Christian worldview. I teach it today. I mean, I talk about Christian, I, I speak at Summit. I was there four weeks ago. Anytime they call, I'll be there talking to kids because it changed my life. You can believe in politics and science and ethics and law and religion and all those things. They can all flow in the same direction. They can co be cohesively together. They don't contradict each other if you have a Judeo-Christian moral values. But that started me. In fact, from then on, I knew I wanted to be in ministry and I knew I wanted to affect politics. After college, Ryan began working in Washington, D.C. for various conservative policy organizations. But after a few years, he felt that God was calling him into ministry. He eventually ended up at Saddleback Church in Southern California with their youth ministry. But first, something had to be addressed. So Doug Fields was the youth pastor at Saddleback, uh, Rick Warren's church. Yeah. They go, hey, um, we have an idea for you. And I was like, okay. And they go, uh, this is your first time in youth ministry. And I was like, yes, for sure. And like, your last name is Dobson. And I was like, it is. And yeah. Like, that seems like a lot of pressure. And I was like, yep, it is. You know, I think you should be under an assumed name and not tell anybody who you are. Yeah. I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, I don't think it's fair. I think you're going to be, I think there will be expectations placed on you that aren't fair because of your last name. I was like, okay. And I went by Ryan James for three or four years. And was James your middle name? That's my first name. That's your first name. I'm James Ryan. Okay. My parents call me James. My parents call me Ryan since I was born. Um, yeah, I went by Ryan James for three or four years. I got my feet wet. I got to fail a bunch of times. I got to be brand new, a total novice, not have any idea what I was doing and get to love on kids and work with them every single week, a few times a week for years. Ryan was doing what he loved. He enjoyed being able to pour himself into the spiritual development of the next generation. And compared to his time in Washington, D.C., this felt like something that was actually meaningful. But Ryan's life was about to enter a dark chapter. His marriage was struggling, and as Ryan explained it to me, he believed in the sacredness of marriage and the finality of till death do us part. So as Ryan fought for and prayed for his marriage, he never imagined what would happen in the end. His wife filed for a divorce, and their marriage fell apart. Ryan was crushed. I wish more people talk about this divorce sure. just so bad. Sure. One of the top five most painful experiences I've been in my entire life. Yeah. It is devil i mean oh my goodness i went into depression like i've never experienced i mean i was sleeping 16 hours a day yeah 18 hours a day yeah. easy yeah easy everybody was worried i mean and by the way i lost my job you know i wasn't in ministry anymore i'm in this big house that was just 
choking me with my mortgage. Yeah. I had no money. Did you have kids? No, didn't have kids. No kids. The Lord blessed me on that one for sure. Yeah. Um, I was born with a disease called ulcerative colitis. That kicked in in the middle of all that. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. It's like Crohn's disease. My body spontaneously produces ulcers in my lower intestine and colon. Hmm. Uh, causes internal bleeding. It causes fevers and cramping. Uh, and you die from it eventually. There is no treatment. There's no cure. Uh, you treat symptoms. Doctors don't know why it happens. Stress exacerbates it. There's no cure. Uh, I thought it was cancer and I didn't have insurance. Yeah. Um, so I was cash paying doctors and taking handfuls of, I mean, they put me on just drugs like crazy for that. Uh, I went from 185 to 135 in my divorce. Wow. Was stress weight. Wow. Um, 50 pounds. I wasn't eating and I wasn't, I was just sleeping all the time. I mean, I was just Cheeto fingers and eating and yeah. sleeping. Um, I watched TV and I ate, ate junk food and I slept. That's all I did. And I got sick. Like, I went to the hospital, I got sick going through my divorce. It was that, it really was that bad. The things people do in divorces are terrible. Man, it felt like I lost all my friends. Yeah. I was lonely. I spent all of my money going to restaurants where the waitress would be nice to me. Hmm. I spent thousands of dollars in restaurants. I went a half a million dollars in debt. I lost my house, lost my car. I lost my job, moved into uh, a very small apartment without I could touch the ceilings, uh, no AC. It was terrible. It was depressing. Did it shake your faith? No. Uh, the Lord was there every step of the way, and I felt him every step of the way. Ryan was at a dark time in his life. He couldn't make sense of why God was allowing his world to fall apart. But even then, God was still near. Ryan had no idea that at his darkest hour, God would use a friend named Lindsay and a unique event to pull him out of his depression. Lindsay invited me surfing. He kept pestering me. And I was like, finally, I was like, all right, I go, I'll go. And he goes, all right, we'll meet at my house at five. And I was like, a.m.? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, I, I was sleeping till noon. Yeah. I would have to get up at 4.15 and drive a half hour to his house to get there at five. I was like, Ugh, no, thank you. And then he just harassed me. He wouldn't stop calling. If he ever hears this, I just appreciate it so much. He, he wasn't mean. He, he wasn't badgering me. He was just like, oh man, you love it. You'll love it. I promise you'll love it. I'll come pick you up. I'll do whatever. You know, just he kept calling. He kept calling. He kept calling. He kept calling. And finally I broke down. I was like, fine, I'll go. And I showed up. Um, yeah, I paddled out. By the way, paddling out is the hardest part of surfing. Surfing's not that hard. Paddling out is hard. Yeah. But I was paddling on a board and a wave was coming towards me and I held onto the front of it and I just put my head down and it washed over me and the Pacific is super cold. And I don't know, but my goodness, it felt like the weight of the world washed over me when that water felt hit me. Hmm. And I felt like I could breathe. I was like going, oh, like when you get out of breath and you're kind of going, oh, 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 I, I felt like I'd been out of breath and I was sitting there and, and a wave started coming my way and Lindsay was started yelling, Ryan, Ryan, paddle, paddle, paddle. And I did. And I stood up on a wave. It was my first one. I was so surprised. I remember turning around and like I was, I was, I dropped down on this wave. I couldn't believe it. Like I promise, I promise, I promise this is a gift from the Lord. I did not know how to surf. I didn't. It was my first time out. You're paddling and you don't feel like you're going anywhere. And w when a wave is coming, it feels like it's sucking you back into it. And you, you're paddling and it feels like you're going backwards. And then all of a sudden there's that tipping point where it, it, it lightens a little bit and then you start sliding like you're going down a hill. And it's surprising and you, you know, uh, and, and the nose might go under a little bit and then, you, and then you'll sink and, 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 and I didn't know what to do and, and I scooted back a little bit and you start going faster and you're going fast and, and, and you're, you're, you're falling downhill on a wave. Yeah. You're following the, that downhill motion and 
I was so surprised when I stood up that I turned around and looked and all the guys were screaming and their arms were up. <sighs> I started laughing. I just laughed and laughed and laughed. I just couldn't believe it. I had never felt anything like it. I remember knowing on that moment I would never stop doing it. Yeah. The Lord is like, you need this so bad, man. It was as if God was using the ocean that day to wash Ryan's troubled heart. That the same God who created the waves that Ryan surfed upon was the same God who created Ryan for his perfect purpose. That God still had plans for Ryan's life despite the hardest moments. As Ryan's heart began healing, God opened the doors for him to begin sharing his experiences and convictions with others. He wrote several books, the first of which was titled Be Intolerant. It was about the lies of moral relativism and the necessity for absolute truth and the need for Christians to proclaim it. Eventually, Ryan began traveling the nation and speaking, sharing the passion that God had given him. He also launched his own podcast about politics and current events from a Christian worldview. It was right around that same time when a couple of friends set him up with the woman who would become his wife today. Called Laura... Uh, the heavens didn't open, the angels didn't sing. We talked, it was like, whatever, I don't know. Um, we set up a date and she stood me up. She stood you up. That's what I say. Um, we met to go surfing. We weren't in the same place and Laura doesn't like to carry a cell phone with her. Yeah. I do. We set up a couple of dates. She doesn't carry her phone. I felt like I was getting stood up. I felt like I got stood up three times. She just was shy and didn't want to just walk. I had green hair at the time too, like for sure, like yellow, green, antifreeze yeah. colored hair. Um, huge holes in my ears. I could stick my pinkies through the plugs in my ears. Wow. Uh, I had a nose ring. I was super pierced, tons of tattoos. Yeah, I guess I was a little bit of a scary guy. Yeah. Um, so we didn't meet then. Uh, it took us a year to actually meet in person. A year. A year. From the a time year. I heard about her until actually meeting was almost an entire year. Wow. So Annie calls me. She's going to be at church tonight. And I didn't want to go. And I finally broke down. I was like, fine, I'll go. And I showed up and Laura did. And I was like, uh-oh, I met the girl I'm going to marry. Yeah. Like I knew it that night. I waited three weeks. I asked her to marry me three weeks later. Three weeks later. Yep. Totally. I asked her mom and dad uh, separately before that. I think I asked her dad after two weeks. You know what he said? What'd he say? Well, it took you long enough. <laughs> and he there's the crazy one he wasn't kidding like laura said she called her mom that night and her mom was like something happened today what is it and she goes why do you say that and she goes you're different and she's like i met a guy and her mom goes oh okay and i guess that was it her parents had been divorced so i met her parents separately and asked them both and they were like yeah for sure well wow. like not even a hesitation well wow. i told my parents two weeks in i was like i met the girl i'm gonna marry and they were like, you're crazy. And I said, I know. Um, I took a meet, I took Laura to meet my parents. They were in Palm Springs. And uh, I remember they were like, oh, you're right. You should totally marry her. Mm. Yeah. I was, I thought they would say something along the lines of, oh, she's lovely, but you've only known each other three weeks. You can't do this. Um, and they were like, oh no, she's perfect. You should definitely get married. Wow. We got engaged on the way home. Wow. I stopped off at a mall and bought a, $25 ring at a kiosk she picked out. You just walked right in there. I walked in to get a band at a jeweler. She saw a kiosk with fake costume jewelry and was like, ooh, that's pretty. I want that one. And I was like, honey, that's $25. And she was like, that's the one I want. And said it in a way that I was like, okay. Yeah. She went to the bathroom. I got a $25 ring. She came out. I got on one knee. That is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got engaged, got married five months and a day later. I On our wedding day, I hadn't known Laura six months. Six months. Yeah. It's been... 13 years, two kids. Ryan and Laura have served the Lord alongside each other for the past 13 years. They've had their share of challenges throughout their marriage, but one thing has kept them centered, their faith in God's abounding love. Little did they know, though, that only a couple of years ago, an adventure from Laura's childhood would come back to haunt their family. When Laura was six years old, her dad sold his dental practice and bought a 65-foot concrete hull sailboat and he packed up mom, dad, dog, three older brothers, and six-year-old Laura, 
and they cast off from Florida and spent two and a half years sailing halfway around the world. Oh, that sounds great. Yep. The brothers talk about it in the most amazing adventure story terms. Like, yeah, the stories I hear from that, you could make a hundred movies from. Wow. Uh, this is pre GPS. Uh, in fact, Big Steve tells me that when they started, he didn't even have the right maps or tools. Uh, that they got stuck early, early on, and some guys came out in a boat and met them. Or like, you don't have the right. They were using a sextant and a compass, and wow, yeah, yeah, like navigating by the stars, kind of wow. stuff. Like for, le- I mean, real legit adventure. Wow, Swiss Family Robinson, Robinson Caruso, you name it, they were out on a sailboat. Yeah, um, and he learned ocean navigation as they went. Yeah, they went through an eleven day storm. Wow. Stayed up for 11 days, uh, uh, rolled rolled the sailboat, almost demastered the boat, said he thought he killed his family that day. But your lower lip is exposed to the sun for two and a half years in the Caribbean on an ocean all day, every day. Uh, your whole body is. Uh, two and a half years ago, Laura went into a dermatologist uh, because she had a sore on her lip that wouldn't go away. And they found out it was an open lesion from advanced squamous cell carcinoma. Wow, cancer. The squamous cell will kill you. It's, um, you, yeah. Uh, so they started doing spot chemo on it where you'd put this treatment on that would burn the top layer of skin off every night. And then uh, your lips will heal during the day. Hmm. And then she would put it back on. It would burn it every single night. And there's nothing for the pain. It's just... And uh, slowly just burn layer after layer after yeah. layer. Just build your way through it. Uh-huh. Uh, and then after 18 months of that... She went in to see the specialist and it had gotten worse and spread. It was substantially worse to where they said, you need to go see a specialist. We saw a specialist and it had spread and they said, you need to do cryo burn, which is pretty advanced. It's Uh, like a form of freezing, I think. Yeah. And so they froze from corner to corner her entire bottom lip. Oh, man. Yeah. They cryo froze the entire thing. The whole lip was a giant scab. Wow. Wow. And I have never seen a look on Laura's face like that. If if she moved her mouth, I mean, she would, any movement of her mouth apparently was like getting struck by lightning. Oh, man. Uh, my wife is a has a pain threshold like you wouldn't believe. So, you know what, Paul? It, I, I won't sugarcoat it. It's totally traumatic. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It was traumatic for my kids. It was traumatic for me. I thought she might die. Uh, you, you just, you, you hear the big C and you just think, oh no, what, well, you know, I bawled my eyes out in the middle of Laura's treatment, telling the Lord, I cannot do this. I'm not strong enough. I am not, I can't do it. I can't do it. And, you know, people say the journey from the head to the heart is the longest. I stood there not feeling the Lord anywhere near me and my head had to tell my heart, you know where he is. You know he is around you, surrounding you, arms around you. (sighs) It was a dark time for the Dobson family with seemingly no way out. After the attempt at cryoburn, the cancer had only spread further into Laura's body. It came down to an urgent surgery. They needed a miracle. We go to two churches. I go to a church that makes me comfortable and I go to a charismatic church that makes me uncomfortable. I was raised Nazarene and very conservative. I had heard someone speak in tongues one time my entire life. We go to my charismatic church and at the end of the service, they say, you know, if you need any prayer for healing or whatever, you know, come down. And Laura said, oh, I want to go down and get prayer. Uh, And I said, for what? And she goes, for my lip. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. This is so embarrassing. I remember thinking, okay, like, you know it's 2018, right, baby? Like, I'm not trying to be mean, but it's 2018. You real like, I, I don't know. I have no problem praying to the Lord to guide the hands of the surgeon. I really have a hard time praying. I prayed that the Lord to remove Laura's cancer in front of my kids because I feel like I should have. I wasn't praying myself to the Lord, asking the Lord to remove her cancer and believing that he would do it. I've asked him too, but I asked him not believing he would do that. And the reason I tell the story that way is because I've heard way too many faith preachers blame the lack of faith on the lack of healing. And I don't believe in that. I think it's the meanest thing to tell someone suffering that their faith is so small. Yeah. That it's their fault they're suffering. How dare you? Yeah. 
they did the surgery. They removed everything from corner to corner all along the bottom of her lip. If you put your tongue in between your teeth and your lower lip and press it down as far as you can go, they took everything off down to that mark. Oh, man. That's not muscle. Oh, um, man. And then rebuilt. She had, I don't know, 100 stitches, maybe more. Who knows? So many. More than you could count. Uh, and then things th things happen that you don't know, that you're unaware of, that you're not prepared for, you didn't anticipate. I was trying to figure out, how do you tell your kids? Like, hey, when you see your mom, it's going to be crazy. Like, it will be crazy. It will look like the Joker a little bit. It's going to be nuts. It's it's scary, and it's and it's swollen, and the stitches look nuts. And when Laura was in recovery, she couldn't see herself, and so she was taking pictures of herself with her cell phone and then looking at her pictures. Yeah. Well, we all have the same iTunes account and the iPhoto account and Lincoln was at home on the iPad and he was going through photos and they all go to the same place. And oh, my, man. my 11 year old saw all that before I could prepare him for it. Oh man. That's bad. Oh, it really man. is. Um, the doctor came out pretty early and I mean, you know, I thought the worst again, because it just kept getting worse. And we were afraid it had gone into her jaw. Like they were really afraid they're going to have to, like we went to the facial reconstructive surgical center. That's what they do. He's a facial reconstructive expert. That's all they do. Yeah. Uh, and they were afraid they're going to have to remove her jaw and like, oh, man. I mean, really like redo her teeth and uh, who knows? So when he came out so early, I knew it had to be so bad that we're going to have to see another specialist, whatever it is. And, and he goes, yeah, the surgery was really successful uh, and there's no cancer. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, yeah. And I go, wow, I can't believe you got it all. And he goes, no, there was no cancer. My layman surface, what he said was, well, it was cancer. For sure it was cancer. When you look at under a microscope, that's what skin looks like when cancer has ravaged it. The skin is so damaged and so decayed and so destroyed. Clearly, you had cancer. But when they do the surgery, they start with biopsies. They have to with that kind of a surgery because they don't know how far they have to go. How far down into the lip do they have to go? How far to the right, to the left? How far into your face? How far into your cheeks, your chin? Is it into the upper lip? They start with biopsies and they take it to a lab. Every biopsy came back cancer-free. Every single one from the start to the finish. And by the way, before anybody sends me an email, I have family members that are like, well, maybe they cut so much before they started testing it. And I'm like, really? So the number one sur facial reconstruction surgeon in Colorado botched his job and that's what happened? He cut too much first and forgot to check for cancer? That's your explanation for what took place. Because he tells me, he's like, well, we had to do the surgery because the skin is so far gone but we can't find any cancer anywhere in your wife, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, couldn't believe it. Shocking. And, and how do you attribute that then? Oh, it's a miracle. 100% miracle. 100% miracle. 100%, yep. And here's what I'll tell all the listeners too. It had nothing to do with me. I promise you that. I went to my pastor afterwards. I said, pastor, I came here. My wife came here to get prayer for healing because she has cancer. And it's, <laughs> he's so great. Super Southern. Sounds like Mater from Toy Story. And he goes, praise Jesus. And I go, yes. And pastor, I didn't believe. And his wife's a redhead and she's so sweet. And she goes, what? And I go, I'm so sorry I didn't. I was so cynical. I did it in front of my kids because I felt guilty about it. But I did not believe. Yeah. And the Lord removed her cancer anyway. What a big God, a God bigger than our, our prayers. Oh, for sure. Here's the, I have to tell the whole story of Christianity though. Laura is in pain 24 hours a day. It doesn't ever go away. This has been the hardest two years of my 48 years on this earth. Mm. I'd go through my divorce a hundred times again before I'd go through the last two years. Yeah. I've never experienced anything like that. Someone asked me, what's been the most surprising thing? How much suffering you can go through? I just said, no, I had no idea how much suffering a person can go through yeah. and then not, and just keep going. The Lord never left and I didn't feel him probably most of the time. And that's only me. Yeah. The Lord can't love me less. Yeah. I just feel it less. Yeah. 
but it doesn't ever fail you. As Ryan explains it, there is no other way to explain Laura's cancer-free body. It's a miracle. They've seen God's hand at work firsthand. And that's not to say they still don't have daily struggles or that Laura's pain from the surgery is gone. It's still there, just like their daily challenges. But if anything, their battle with cancer has only strengthened their resolve to continue their ministry. Ryan is still podcasting, but this time with his wife. Their current show is called Rebel Parenting, and their goal is to strengthen marriages and parents through honest dialogue. When you have a crisis in your marriage or parenting, because you will, call us. It'll be okay. The addictions, the hurt, the pain, the selfishness, we just want to be honest. Honest, honest, honest. Marriage is super hard. Yeah. But when it's good, there's no better tool for finding Jesus than being married or parent or a parent. Mm. There's no... There's no chisel sharper. There's no sandpaper rougher than a wife or a kid. Yeah. You know what? Here's the truth. I can't tell you how bad divorce is and it's bad, but in the same way, I can't tell you how great marriage is Yeah. because it's so much better than you could ever possibly imagine. It's the greatest thing. I wouldn't want anybody else to be around Laura when she's going through this stuff. I wouldn't want one other person. I would be so envious I'd be so envious of anybody around her helping her out in these times of need. I get to be there. I get to be there for all the worst times. My kids, like being a parent, would you want anybody else around your kid when they're in crisis? No. Like it, it breaks my heart so bad. Like it, I have never cried like I've cried when my kids are sad, but my goodness, what an honor when I'm a bad parent and I'm a bad spouse and I can't see any way forward. I just remind myself, the Lord, he thinks different things of you. Yeah. yeah. He thinks you're amazing. He knew you'd do all these things, man. Ryan, he knew you'd blow it. And before you did, he was like, what? You think I care about that? Here's how little I care about that. I'm going to die for you. I don't care about that. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to get lashed 39 times. I'm going to get scourged. I'm going to get made fun of. I'm going to get a crown of thorns put on my head. I'm going to get a robe and a fake scepter put in my hand. I get made fun of just to show you I love you. You think you're not worth it? You think you're a bad guy? You think you're a failure? What? Have you seen what I paid for you? Have you seen the price tag on you? Man, you're dumb. And I am. The price tag is the Lord Jesus Christ. Whew. Yeah. Man, I'm going to tell a billion people about that. Just so they can know it too. Yeah. That's why I'm doing this with you. Just for the chance to say that. You give me one chance to say that, I'll do this a hundred times. Thank you for letting me say that to anybody that'll listen to you. That yeah. for me is a gift. Thanks, man. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan's honesty and candor about God's goodness and faithfulness is refreshing. Our God is the master of creation and the God of comfort. God can use anything to bring peace to our hearts and show his presence to us. It could be an act as simple as surfing on the ocean or enjoying the world that God has created. Or it can be as astounding as the miraculous healing from cancer that Ryan's wife, Laura, experienced. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I hope that you too have been encouraged by Ryan's story. To learn more about Ryan and his ministry, visit his website, rebelparenting.org, or subscribe to his podcast, Rebel Parenting. You can also visit our website, compelledpodcast.com, and find today's episode. We'll include a link to Ryan's website, some of the books that he's written, and a link to Summit Ministries, the summer camp Ryan attended as a teenager that changed his life. Again, all of that at compelledpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's story and want to keep hearing more of these, then here are a couple of ways you can help out. The first way is to join Compelled as a monthly member. We have different membership levels starting at $10 a month, and a perk of membership is getting to listen to the behind-the-scenes recordings from our interviews. So if there was a guest that you really enjoyed listening to, there's a really good chance we actually have up to two hours of interview time with them. And you can listen to the full interview and hear all kinds of stories that we didn't have time to include in our regular show. And as a compelled monthly member at $10 a month, you now get access to all of those behind-the-scenes interviews, tens of hours of additional content. 
And a new benefit that we just added to the $15 a month membership level is an exclusive monthly live stream. Once a month, you'll be sent a link to an invite-only live stream where you can meet other compelled listeners. You can meet some of the team members from the podcast, ask us questions about how we chose the guests that month and additional insights that those guests had. And every once in a while, we might even bring on one of our guests from the show to directly answer any questions you have. And for a limited time, the first 50 listeners to sign up as monthly members at any level will receive a free movie from Christian Cinema, another one of our sponsors. Since 1999, Christian Cinema has provided entertainment that inspires families. Christian Cinema has no monthly fees and they have the largest selection of Christian and family-friendly movies. You can watch a movie today at christiancinema.com and get a free movie by becoming a compelled monthly member. But of course, the biggest benefit of being a monthly member is that you're allowing Compelled to continue sharing these important stories. You can become a monthly member today by visiting compelledpodcast.com and clicking the link at the top that says become a member. The second way that you can support Compelled is by sharing this episode with your friends. Ryan has a compelling story of trusting God in the midst of divorce, depression, and cancer. And if you know someone who would be encouraged by Ryan's story, please share this with them. And also consider sharing this episode on social media and why you were encouraged. Our show was edited by Zach Fowler. Find him online at zachfowlerimagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost. You can view his work online at siadesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups. You can follow Ben on Instagram at ben.billups. Our media assistant is Frank Allegrea. You can find him on Twitter at the Frank Allegrea. And our assistant producer is none other than my lovely wife, Sarah Hastings. Our guest next Tuesday is Sheila Booth Albertstadt, a popular children's book author who treated God less like the creator of the universe and more like her personal genie in a bottle until she encountered him like never before. Stay tuned for a sneak peek from that story. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and we'll be back with another compelling story next Tuesday. This episode of Compelled is sponsored by Patriot Academy. Patriot Academy raises up leaders with a biblical worldview that boldly champion the cause of freedom and truth through government. Patriot Academy holds intense week-long trainings at state capitals around the nation, and attendees learn about the legislative process by participating in a mock legislature, filing and debating bills and policies. All the while, they learn fundamental principles and truths. I actually attended Patriot Academy a few years ago in Texas, and it was an incredible experience. I got to sit at the same desk and debate on the same floor as actual Texas legislators. I made close friends and learned important character traits. But most importantly, I saw firsthand the desperate need we have as Christians to engage the culture and not shrink away. This summer, Patriot Academy will hold seven different academies across America, and there's a good chance one of them will be near you. Compelled listeners can receive $25 off tuition by using the promo code COMPELLED. Learn more at PatriotAcademy.com. Again, that's PatriotAcademy.com. I remember saying, God, I want to sacrifice my life to you today and give you everything. And and you just do whatever you want to do. If you want to take away my family, if you want to take away my career, if you want to take away my house, whatever you've got to do to make me more like Jesus, I am, I'm, I'm yours.